Welcome to India's Space Research Centre, the physical research laboratory in Ahmedabad. It's great to see such a mix of people here, as well as astrophysicists. We've got school children and members of the public. And we're all here, together with our partners from Welcome Collection, because we are on the brink of India's most ambitious space adventure yet, a mission to Mars. India has a long and illustrious history of space research. This place, PRL as it's known, was set up right after independence in 1947. India has developed rockets. It's launched satellites and in 2008 it even went to the moon, astonishing the world by discovering evidence of water there, something every other lunar mission had missed. The next target is of course Mars. The rocket is ready at the launch center just outside Chennai and, weather permitting, will blast off on November the 5th, just after Diwali. It is reckoned to be the cheapest Mars mission in history, but there is no shortage of ambition. If the probe survives the more than 300 million kilometer journey, it will attempt to answer the biggest question of them all, seeking out signs of life on the red planet. Jitendra Nath Goswami was called the hero of India's moon mission. He is the director of the center and the senior scientific advisor to India's Mars Orbiter mission. It is a privilege that he's found time to join us at this crucial moment in Indian space research. Please would you join me in welcoming Professor Goswami. <coughs> Thank you, Professor. Professor Goswami, the, the rocket's on the launch pad. Yes. It's being prepared. The final preparations before takeoff are being done. You must be very nervous. Not really, because I have experienced that nervousness during Chandrayaan 1 time. And Chandrayaan 1, of course, was the moon mission. Moon mission. And then uh, I'm very confident that uh, the people who are taking care of it, they know what they're doing. And I think we'll be off for Mars on uh, November 5th. You think they will? Now, November the 5th is an interesting day, particularly in Britain. In Britain, as you may know, it's firework day. Everyone in Britain is letting rockets off on the 5th of November, obviously not quite as big as yours. Why did you choose the 5th of November? Is the date auspicious in some way? Not at all. <laughs> we wanted to go much earlier, on 28th. October, day before. The 28th of October. Yeah, and then because of certain technical issues, because we need some ship to be at certain points so that they can receive some data from the You've spacecraft. You've got some ships way down in the Pacific Ocean, Pacific, haven't you? Yeah, which, will, which will relay information, information from the rocket That was very essential at the beginning. And uh, since they were not in the place at that point of time with all the, you know, uh, instrument that are needed and tested because of rough weather in the sea which was not thought about not so we had to delay it so instead of 28 now it is fifth and I think uh, in another couple of days we'll start filling up all the propellant that is needed in the upper stages. So putting the fuel into the rocket ready yeah. to go. Very exciting but this as you know far better than me is a huge challenge you're going to be traveling, what, about 300 million kilometers? Yeah, if you think, because we will keep on traveling around our own planet for quite some time, more than a month. And then if you add that mileage or kilometers, yes. The orbits that you do of the Earth, yeah, which we'll come and to and later, to the, this incredible yeah. distance you travel to Mars, we're talking 300 million uh, kilometers. But the odds, you know, I don't want to be a downer at the beginning of this, but the odds are terrible. Let me just run through some history of kind of Mars missions. No country, correct me if I'm wrong, has ever successfully reached Mars on its first attempt. You are right. There have been 51 separate Mars, Mars missions in history. 21 have been successful, that's all. Both Japan and China, their recent missions failed. You've already told me you're confident. Why are you so confident? See, I, I think uh, we try to go to Mars in a very modest way and we know what we are doing and uh, of course you can never tell space is very unforgiving. If something goes wrong there, you cannot go up and correct it. <laughs> no one can help you. <laughs> no one can help you. So I am not a believer of anything, so I believe in work. 
But I think many people who believe in supreme power in India, involved in the mission, they may pray they that may pray everything should go well. But you are confident that it will go well. And of course, there's been justified national pride in India's achievement with Chandrayaan, the, uh, the, the lunar mission. Uh, and this Mars mission is, of course, even more ambitious as we've been hearing. Now, what I'd like to know from you, the audience, is how important is the mission to you in the room? I mean, if, for example, India gets to, uh, to, to Mars before China, would that matter to you? Could, could, could you raise your hands, please, those of you who'd want to see, who would like to see India get to Mars before China or Japan? Please raise your hands. <laughs> now then, how many have we got? What do you reckon? You know, come on, there's hands going up and then going down. We need, I need a, we need a decisive... I, yeah, it's not that many. It's 40 or 50 percent, yeah, I'd say. 40 percent. I, I like that. You like that, do you? Because we don't, we don't want to do competition with anybody. You we don't just see it as a competition, and yeah, obviously people yeah, have been shy to say yeah. that. But we've got, like, 40, I'd say 40, 45 yeah, percent, shall yeah. we say. Well, my, my, uh, my colleague uh, Shanu Yadev from the BBC Hindi service is in the audience with a microphone. So... What I'd like to know now, I mean, who feels that this import is important for India and why? Would somebody like to answer that question? There's somebody in the second row there. It's, a, it's very important for us. I think it's about time that India finally said, uh, we went to Mars, we make a mark on Mars. And uh, it's a matter of, of pride for us as a youth. A matter of pride for India. Would you agree with that? You see, when the audience says something, I think it is better to agree <laughs> rather than say something different. <laughs> <laughs> but would anyone else like to comment? I mean, why is it significant getting to Mars? What does it mean for India? Some, there's somebody up there, there's a couple of... I think it's a good learning opportunity for us to uh, kind of, you know, get on with this mission and learn lots of new things which are needed in the operation. So it's a great learning opportunity. There was somebody a couple of seats behind you. If you just pass the microphone on to him. Apart from national pride and apart from countries in their race to reach plans first, it's actually about contributing to science. You know, NASA had its mission to moon but couldn't discover water there. India did it. So it's not about the country which actually matters. It's actually discovering things over there. And that will be global. And that will be a fact that will be universally accepted then. So I like that. <laughs> <laughs> so it's about the global understanding that a mission like this can bring. And we're going to now talk a bit more about that. Um, we'll come back, of course, to the issue of national pride. But first off, yeah, I mean, you've, you've, we've described in a little bit of detail the, the issues of getting to Mars. But let's, let's talk a bit more about that. How, 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 how are you going to get to Mars? Because let's start off, the audience may not understand that the, the rocket that you're using is actually a rocket designed for launching satellites into low Earth orbit, about 200 kilometers. And yet you're telling me that you're confident this l relatively small rocket can go 300 million kilometers. Yeah, I think uh, we have something, uh, the, the rocket is called a polar satellite launch vehicle, which uh, sends polar satellites, like you said, a few hundred kilometers above the Earth's uh, surface. But uh, now it is made a bigger version, we call PSLV XL, maybe extra, extra large. large extra maybe, large, yeah. so you've put Could a bit be. of extra fuel on yeah, it. So but how are you going to get this rocket out into space, out on the journey okay, to and, Mars? And uh, once we have that, you see, this is the same... Uh, you know, rocket which has taken Chandrayaan one mission to Moon. So all we need to do is to be, you know, in, be some sort of smart. I could say how to do the orbiting and finally going to Mars, so that this same rocket with some additional fuel and unfortunately less science payload we can reach the Mars. So there has okay. to be a balance. But what you're going to do? So you launch the rocket into Earth orbit. And then this is what's quite interesting. You orbit Earth, releasing a bit of fuel to speed up the rocket progressively as it, as it orbits Earth. How does that work? Yeah, it, it's like that. You see, first you have to put it in an orbit around the Earth. So now when it comes close to Earth, because it is always an elliptical orbit, when it comes close to Earth, it speeds up. So at that point, it is much easier to give it some another kick a so that you extra can oomph. extra energy and so it goes little up again, and so this will even keep on faster. faster, then it will keep on going and we like to attain a velocity, you know, in that manner, close to 10 kilometers per second. The precise number is, I think, 9.7 
kilometer per second. What when is that? Let's translate that into per second, kilometers an hour. Kilometer is an hour. You have to multiply by more than 3,000. Okay. So, so we're talking 21,000 kilometers. 21,000 kilometers an hour. So I, very, I very fast. I hope I'm correct. Okay. And then uh, once that happens, that is the time when we have to, because we have very good people who do all the calculation. Because you see, when you are trying to go to Mars, we have three objects which is affecting the spacecraft. One is gravity of our own planet. Sun is always there. And after some time, Mars will be also in the picture. So when you do all this calculation, then they can find out up to what speed we should keep on moving and go around the Earth so that at what time we can say, OK, let's go to Mars. And you basically, one last jet from your rocket blasted off out of Earth's orbit and off into space. But I mean, what intrigues me about the challenge of reaching Mars is how accurate you have to be. I mean, when you think you're leaving Earth, heading for a distant target, a target 300 million effectively in terms of the, the journey that you must take to get there, about 300 million kilometers, any tiny error will be hugely magnified on the journey. So, I mean, this is very, very rudimentary science, but this morning in the hotel I was thinking about this problem and trying to work out what the scale of the error might be. And I worked out if, 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 it was, if you were a tenth of a degree out, which would be a huge amount, I understand, in space science, but a tenth of a, de the degree, a degree out over the course of the entire journey would be almost 700,000 kilometers out by the time you reach the place on Mars. How can you be so confident you're going to get there? See, I cannot say I am confident, but I'm confident about the people right. who are doing it, and uh, I think we'll make it. And uh, you see, once we release it to go to Mars, at that time we have to be very precise. Because after that, we don't have much error there, because it is going and sun is, you know, just uh, diddling a little, so it will reach some point when again the criticality comes, because then we are in Mars influence, so we have to adjust everything properly so that it can orbit around the Mars, or as you call it, captured by Mars. So you've reached Mars, then you have to make sure that you get into the right orbit in Mars. I'm sorry to list all these problems, but this is a huge technical challenge. These are precise, difficult measurements. You, you see, I, I, I know that they may be difficult, but you know, since we have the experience with the uh, moon where we have gone up to 100 kilometers, we are very happy there for about eight months, then it warmed up a little, so we went to 200 kilometers. So going, here we have to go 300 kilometers, it is far off than 100 kilometers. Yeah. So I, I think uh, we, we should be able to handle it. Well, let's assume that you've got, you've got to Mars, you've got into the orbit. Congratulations, Professor Goswami. Now to the most <laughs> interesting question of them all. What are you actually gonna do once you're there? Why is India going to Mars? If you look at Department of Space, which handles all these affairs, is emphasizing that this is a technology mission. But we are still happy as scientists that they said, OK, come on, there is some space for you. So we started with about 45 kilogram, and now we have 14.5 kilograms. Hold on, that, the payload for the scientific, scientific mission is 14 and a half kilos. Kilogram. Which and we were joking earlier is less than the baggage that you get when you go on an aeroplane. I mean, we're talking about... <laughs> we're talking free about, baggage. Yeah, the free, free baggage. baggage. Exactly. You'd have to, you know, that you, you could, you'd have probably get it in cabin, you know, 14 and a half uh, yeah. kilos. With a tiny payload like that, what, can, you, can you really do any useful science? I, I, I'm proud. We have very intelligent and smart people who can do things <laughs> with small... A little round of applause there. <laughs> A great many of those people are in this room today, aren't they? Yeah, I mean, uh, at least many of those who are associated and... I mean, what can you do, serious science, with a payload as small as 14 and a half? Yes, uh, I, I think so. See, we have selected quite a few payloads, but finally, because of the constraint of how much we can carry, actually, I was a party to it, we have decided that only those which are looking at Mars, they will get in. One of them <coughs> seeks to begin to attempt to answer the most alluring question of all about, about Mars, which is, of course, is there 
uh, now or has there ever been life on Mars? Now, we've got, there's ambiguous evidence, isn't there, about this. Um, telescopes have suggested there may be methane on Mars. Methane is in mostly produced by organic uh, processes, but NASA has a rover on Mars as we speak, and it's found no evidence of methane. Now, how is your approach going to be different? See, in telescopic observation from our own planet, they said there could be 10 to 60 parts per billion of methane in the atmosphere. Then, Mars Global Surveyor, they tried to see something, okay? And they also claim that it is about 10 to 30 parts per billion. But all these are slightly indirect evidence. Mm -hmm. And there are a lot of problems. Our own atmosphere is a big filter which has to be corrected. What do you think your approach is going to do differently and why might it give us a different kind of answer to previous we, uh, we, 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 we do not think any of these numbers has been agreed universally as yet. There are difference, like we said, that curiosity it went to a place on Mars and they said it is less than one part per billion. But personally, I think that doesn't mean there is nothing of it all over the Mars. It is almost like, you know, looking at the elephant and touching the tail and giving one remark and it need not be that other places, some, everything should be same. So what you're going to be doing is looking across the whole of the surface of Mars. Yeah, I mean, uh, we have an instrument, very simple instrument, which you can call you can call it spectrometer or whatever, you get a particular line. All the molecules, I mean, they are not at all restive. They are always jumping around and dancing around, and we call it vibrational, rotational. So when they vibrate or rotate, and then when it comes back, then it emits something. So basically, when the sun so shines on any molecule, it will stimulate it. Will it, it will absorb, will absorb move, some energy, and, dance, and release some energy, and then out. release the same energy. So I think. What we are trying to see, can we see a signal where we have very little sense of overlapping with something else that we know of? And we can cut out anything we do not know by looking next to it. Right. Okay? And we'll call that background because if our instrument is working properly, this signal should not be there. So how significant would it be if the Indian Mars mission was able to say with some certainty the rear arts, there is a significant amount of methane in the Martian atmosphere. Let's say we find this organic molecule on Mars, how it came about. See, that's the question. And like uh, people say, we are all organic in our body. We are just an organic compound. Life is organic. It is not inorganic. There could be silicon-based life somewhere. We do not know about it. But if... Uh, <coughs> That is true. We have to really know if at any time before on Mars there was some activity, large scale activity, which could have produced this particular CH4. Means so you have to make four hydrogen, meet a carbon, and make friends. So that's not very easy. If there was a biological precursor, you can always produce methane. But let's be clear, why would it be so significant if there were organic molecules, if there was life on Mars? I think for people on this planet, the question is that are we alone is a very tough question. Okay, we know we are here only for a couple of million years. Our planet has evolved for more than four billion years. And uh, we didn't... Uh, Something like a couple of million years, uh, you know, uh, we have uh, human beings or it is precursors and we are already thinking if there is nobody around us or if there is somebody may come after one billion years from now in a place like Mars. We do not know. It is so many layers. It is worse than an onion. Uh, you do not get to the core of it. I mean, it would be it. very significant if yeah. in our solar system, life or organic molecules have developed on two planets, that would suggest, would it not, that it's much more likely that life has developed outside of our solar system, elsewhere in the universe. And that would begin to answer the question you've just raised, whether or not we're alone here. Yeah. 
You are listening to the BBC World Service and Exchanges at the Frontier from the heart of India's Space Research Centre, the Physical Research Laboratory in Ahmedabad, India, with me, Justin Rowlatt. We're on the eve of the launch of India's first mission to Mars, and I'm speaking to Professor Jitendra Goswami, Senior Scientific Advisor to the Mars Orbital Mission. Later, we'll be asking whether it's right that India puts money into space research when there's so much poverty here at home, and why everyone seems so excited about Mars at the moment. But first, who would like to ask Professor Goswami about what we've been discussing so far, the technical challenges of getting to Mars and the science that will be done when India gets there? Um, there are questions all <laughs> over the room. Um, should we start uh, over here? What are the inbuilt, inbuilt uh, techniques you have developed in that so that some lightning or asteroids are coming in the path so it will be able to detect and take preventive measures from it. How will uh, you be able to avoid asteroids, okay, Professor? Okay, you see, lightning is only close by. So anyway, we can avoid that when you go up there. As far as anything like asteroid or meteor hitting, it is once in a, I will call, not billion. What is next to billion? Trillion? Trillion? Okay. So I think uh, we, because you see, they are, you know, just think about the possibility of something coming and everything is moving and I know little bit about meteorites because that is uh, where I work so I don't think you have to worry about it unless we had something like a meteor shower okay so okay. your rocket is very small and so are the meteorites in space is very big there's a question yeah. over there uh, in that 14.5 kilogram machine, what all are we carrying apart from that methane sensor device? What all are we carrying and what all are our plans to bring back home? So what else have you got? We'll okay, just summarize it's, quickly it's good. I, I, I'm happy. See, we have uh, another one which will, you see, that, that will also look at the surface of the Mars, okay? And then it will measure temperature, okay? And based on that temperature, if you're very smart, you can tell what kind of rock is you are looking at. The sensor which is looking for methane, okay, the sensor which is looking at this, uh, what the type of rocks and terrain is, and the camera which is just take pictures in color, okay, they all are put together so that when it is looking at methane or something else, the camera also knows where from it is looking. What are the other things that you've got on board? See, one is called infrared, thermal infrared spectrometer. Right. Okay. Another is Lyman alpha photometer, that is D by H ratio. And the last one, we wanted to see what is in the atmosphere. Okay? So we have a mass spectrometer. This is Exchanges at the Frontier from the BBC World Service. 100 women, half the world speaks. This week, in the Age of Reason, meet one of Britain's best-known politicians, Shirley Williams. I was passionate about several things. I was certainly passionate about removing privilege in education. I'm Razia Iqbal, and I'll be asking her about becoming one of the few women MPs in the 1960s. I discovered quite quickly that being a woman was a difficult and different thing to be. I mean, I remember people saying things to me like, um, I think it's appropriate you should be here and how she supports women in politics around the world. Generally speaking, women leadership does seem to be good at bridging differences, good at bringing people together, good at creating single communities. She now sits as a Liberal Democrat peer in the House of Lords and at the age of 83 is still campaigning. The Age of Reason, online at bbcworldservice.com. This is Exchanges at the Frontier from the BBC World Service. Within days, India will launch a rocket to Mars. I'm Justin Rowlett, and I'm in Ahmedabad, the capital of Gujarat, and the home of India's Space Research Centre. I'm here with the Mars Mission's senior scientist, Jitendra Goswami. Next, I'll be asking whether a country with such poverty should be investing in space research. That's Exchanges at the Frontier after the news. BBC News with Mike Cooper. Pakistan has reacted angrily to the drone strike that killed the leader of the Pakistani Taliban. The Interior Minister said the death of Hakimullah Mesud had destroyed the government's attempts to hold peace talks with the militants, but other officials said they were still determined to pursue negotiations. 
Security forces have been put on high alert across the country. Japan and Russia have agreed to step up cooperation between their military forces. After talks in Tokyo, the Japanese foreign minister said the move would help maintain peace and security in East Asia. Correspondents say Moscow has actively sought closer relations with Japan, partly to counter China's growing influence. Malaysia has summoned the heads of the US and Australian diplomatic missions in Kuala Lumpur as a row over an alleged American-led spying network in Asia grows. On Friday, China and Indonesia demanded an explanation following reports that US, British, Canadian and Australian embassies were being used to monitor phone calls and collect data as part of American surveillance. The Kenyan authorities have promised to take immediate action following worldwide outrage over the brutal rape of a 16-year-old girl and criticism of the lenient punishment for the three suspects who were caught. More than one million people have signed an online petition demanding justice. Reports from Russia say one of the members of the protest punk band Pussy Riot has not been heard of since she was transferred to a new prison more than a week ago. The husband of Nadezhda Tolokonikova said his wife was still weak after two hunger strikes and accused the authorities of trying to punish her because of her protests. Tunisia has been banned for a year from one of the most important tournaments in men's tennis, the Davis Cup, after local tennis officials ordered a player not to compete against an Israeli opponent last month. The International Tennis Federation said the decision would send a strong message to all its members that prejudice had no place in sport and would not be tolerated. BBC News. This is Exchanges at the Frontier in Ahmedabad, India, and I'm talking to the space scientist Jitendra Goswami about India's mission to Mars. You're a scientist, Professor Goswami, and of course you're interested predominantly in the findings of the expedition. But you can understand the national pride that people feel in the fact that uh, India is going to Mars, surely. Yes, I think uh, we will probably have the same kind of euphoria if we reach there, maybe a little less than what we had at the time of Chandrayaan-1. Chandrayaan-1, on the moon yeah. mission. Moon mission, because you see, that was uh, very heartening. And I think people gave us more credit than we should get, of course after we made the discovery of the water, water. Yeah. then I think uh, you know that we have done something important. But actually this mission to Mars as we've heard is a technically much more ambitious than going to the moon. Now how does it feel for you personally? I mean you grew up in India in the years after independence. What was life like growing up in that period and was space research something that you imagined that India would do in the future? I don't think uh, that I have imagined about space research until the Sputnik, which went up in 1957, and uh, somebody, even in a place like Assam, which is very remote in northeast, and in a mid-sized town, we were asked to lie down on the, you know, uh, in front of the lawn and people try to identify it, if I can see the Sputnik. As it went overhead Over. through the heavens. But could you imagine the India it. that you were growing up in, could you imagine India becoming involved in sending objects into space and going to Mars? I have to be very honest. I don't think until there was some discussion that uh, we'll plan someday to go to the moon. I didn't think that we'll move this fast. You didn't think India would? Uh, I mean, not when I'm still working. <laughs> okay. Really? <laughs> not, na not naturally, because, you know, in 80s, I think uh, anybody talking about spending certain amount of money in India in some project which is look very exotic would have been shut down. We're not doing very well economically, and one has to realize if you are spending something for the betterment of the countries, people's life, and other kind of stuff, exp you know, such kind of expenditure is maybe welcome. But when we have to do something just for knowledge check and which takes good amount of money, okay, that would have been very difficult to convince difficult people to in justify. 1980s. Well, you said it would have been unthinkable back in the 80s, 30 years ago, but India is still not a rich country. And let me give you some... Um, statistics because despite recent growth there is still profound poverty in India. Um, the average Indian child gets just four years of schooling. 
Fewer than half of all infants have fully, are fully immunized. 43% of children below five are underweight. Half of all Indians do not have access to a toilet. Um, when I tweeted asking people for questions to ask you at this, uh, uh, here in this auditorium, virtually over, oh, everybody said, why is India spending so much money on space research when there are such issues at home, such issues of poverty? Why do you think it's acceptable now? See, this is, this is what I'm telling. The money you are spending, for example, this mission, it may be 50 to 60 million dollars. Okay? The whole thing? The whole thing, and it is spent over four, four years or so, three, four years. So on a given year, we are spending something like $15 million, which is not even 0.01% of, uh, you know, what we have been, the government is trying to spend to change this situation. But this is a system problem that we are facing now. Rather, the, it is the a more of an implementation, a right. implementation of something so that we can bring this up. I do agree with you that we have a lot of poverty, a lot of problems, uh, and a lot, you know, lack of education at all levels. And this is, but you see, I will tell you from a scientist's perspective, I have been assigned a job. I should do the best I can as long as the community of scientists is supported by the people who are supposed to take care of everybody. And if they say that, okay, if you want to go and it is good and it will be good for the country, then I think we should not feel uncomfortable because there are some other people, either I personally or others around me, has not been able to take okay, care so of. Okay, so what tangible benefits will there be for Indians from this mission? You see, I will not say tangible, because that word tangible implies, like, you know, you do something, you get something out, then you can do so a calculation, yeah. and then you can put a number. Most benefits are, I will say, non-tangible, but they're very important. Like my seeing the Sputnik going up, I probably saw something As else. As a child lying a on child the lawn looking lawn. up at space. I, I think, okay. And then same way, I think these things will inspire certain group of people to do something even more than this, okay? And not necessarily that they will take care of social problem, but science problem, which are much more frontier problem than what we are doing. So this will be, a, what we are, this is, I think this is a very uh, tangible benefit in the long run. You see, right now, since you talk about something about India, I can also tell something positive about India I think many of the countries in the world cannot run the business today without Indian people taking the back end of all the business. <laughs> so we are proud about our outsource. You certainly are, listening to that okay. applause. I mean, I, I, I thank you. <laughs> it, it, it's so, but it's so it, it's how you look at it. Yeah, and so you're saying this is powerfully inspirational, that young Indian children today yeah. will be able to look up at the stars outside their village and look at Mars, because of course we can all see Mars in the night sky, and know that, with any luck, India will have been up to Mars. And you think that will be inspirational? Does the audience agree that that was an inspirational thing for India? Yes, I think that's an overwhelming yes, isn't Thank it? Thank you again. <laughs> but um, th 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 there are criticisms of the way that you've done this. I mean, you've said yourself that you're using quite old-fashioned technology. You're using a rocket that was designed to go 200 mi kilometers, and you're trying to take it 300 uh, million kilometers, and you've made a very persuasive case that that's possible and that India will achieve it. But you could have waited, because India's developed another rocket, hasn't it? a rocket designed to launch satellites into geostationary orbit, which is significantly higher, 20,000 plus kilometers. Now that rocket could have taken a much bigger payload. Instead of taking, you know, cabin luggage, 14 and a half kilos, you could have taken 1,800 kilos. See, and why didn't you wait? Bigger the luggage doesn't mean that it contains very useful stuff. <laughs> <laughs> However, I do agree that it is good to have a bigger luggage uh, when you want to do something. So I, I, I think uh, in principle, we should do what we think we can do best with whatever resources that is available. 
And I can tell you, GSLV, we are going to moon again. It is an approved program. With Which is the geostationary launch vehicle. We, uh, that we have so to use because th it's much more powerful, the more much powerful more rocket. Powerful, much more heavy. And let me tell you, in You're space... You're going back to the moon. So Mars isn't enough. You want to go back to the moon. Uh, but we are going with a lander, rover, orbiter, okay? And we, have, uh, we, we expect to have Russian collaboration also. Okay, because so it you're, does plan you're saying is, you know, this isn't just an orbit that in, you're not going to put a probe in orbit around the moon. You're planning to land on the moon. Land on the moon. Manned mission? No. No, but you're going to put a rover on the moon. Rover on the moon, and then we'll have an orbiter, and this is on that plan. Okay, it will happen maybe in a couple of years or something from now. So I think. Uh, so uh, India has continuing ambitions in space. Yeah, uh, but you see the GSLV, what we call geostationary launch vehicle. This is the larger new one. Large rocket. one. See, we must have for we must have a we must remember that we have to serve the country. Today we have not been able to launch as many geostationary satellite we need ourselves. We are going to the France Ariane Agency to launch some of them. So we have to always worry that we need geostationary today just to serve the country. So you need to launch these geostationary so, uh, satellites. satellites so that we can have more for communication. What kind, of, what kind of functions do you need these satellites for? All communication. Telecommunication. Telecommunication, all TV broadcast, everything, whatever you call it. it. It's very important and then once we satisfy that need, then only we can tell them, let's go to moon with a geostationary satellite. But there is something interesting here about space research more generally, which is that you are effectively um, having to start from first principles. India is having to develop its own rockets. It's going to have to look, for example, at the, there needs to be a certain amount of automation with your uh, Mars uh, probe because of the delay it takes to send signals. You've got to learn how to do that, and what, that's one of the technical challenges you'll be making. Yeah, that's a Why, very given that Russia has been been to uh, Mars, the Europeans have been to Mars, and of course America has been to Mars many times. Why, does, why doesn't the world share its space technology? I, I think it is a very difficult question to answer from my perspective. I would like that people share technology, but you see, the other end is that if somebody spent 20 years making a technology, then sharing it becomes a little difficult proposition immediately. But I am looking forward for a world where everybody will share technology with each other and we can all go together, okay, and rather than going alone. And that can happen only when you share. So would you share with NASA? Of course. You would. If NASA came and said, we're interested in your Mars mission, open your books up, show us what you've been we doing. We have flown two payloads from supported by NASA on Chandrayaan-1. It has German payload, you have a Swedish payload, even it has a Bulgarian payload because okay, it was so small that we saved some weight. So you, so you took these other payloads, but would you share with China, with Japan? <laughs> ah. See, Japan, we are already good, uh, we have collaboration even on Chandrayaan on mission, we are sharing data, we are exchanging stuff. As far as China is concerned, I think I even cannot say anything because <laughs> I don't know many Chinese except a few whom I, you know, whom I met in conference and meeting. So you see, that is a very difficult question for me. But as far as Europe, USA, Russia, we are already collaborating. We're almost out of time now, but I have one question that I'd like to ask you before we throw things open to the floor again, and I know there'll be plenty of questions from the floor. We talked about the serious science you want to undertake, looking at the changing atmosphere of Mars, searching for methane for signs of life, but I want to ask you about something more speculative now. Um, one of your colleagues, uh, Professor U. R. Rao, has been speculating, you're smiling now, about how we could seed life on Mars using bacteria, using cacti, in order to create a, a greenhouse effect and maybe in how long? 500, 1,000 years, we could, uh, we could have a habitable atmosphere on, on, on Mars, maybe even colonize the planet. That sounds like science fiction. Do you believe that that could happen? Some science fiction has become reality. So I will not outright say I don't believe in it, but I am a little skeptical about it. A little skeptical. But of all the, of all the opportunities for interplanetary colonization, Mars offers the best opportunities. Yeah, that's that what I also told. 
I mean, if we can do it, it will be great. But I don't know when and how. Thank you. I'm Justin Rowlatt and this is Exchanges at the Frontier from the Physical Research Laboratory in Ahmedabad, India. We're on the eve of the launch of India's first mission to Mars and I'm speaking to Jitendra Goswami, Senior Scientific Advisor to the Mars Orbital Mission. In the last couple of minutes that we've got, who would like to ask Professor Goswami a question about anything that we've been discussing? Lots of hands going up. We'll get as many as we can. There's, uh, there's a young lad there in the yellow shirt. Let's ask him. So what after the Chandrayaan 2? What after Chandrayaan 2? It, it is the, see, you the look space. at the young people. Yeah. They're, they're, they're so worried about what will happen 10 years from now. <laughs> you see? Oh, Chandrayaan 2 is the, <laughs> is the next, next space one. mission. This yeah. is one with the probe. Yeah. After. So you're saying what happens after that mission? See, I, I think, let me tell you something. You see, we have come to a stage that we should slowly get out of here. And then you should ask more younger people, like people who are making the instrument today, those who are designing the spacecraft today, those who are doing the how to go there, and those people will be more ambitious and they can tell you something which you may see in your life itself. See, I can tell something, but you know, it's not very interesting. They may have much better idea. Than okay, me. but we've only got, we've got you here in the seat, so do try and answer his question. What do you think, <laughs> what do you think will happen after Chandrayaan 2 which is, the, which is the probe that you hope to, the uh, rover that you hope to land on Mars? See, on if you Mars. ask me frankly, I would like a technology mission to go beyond Mars, asteroid belt also, so that we learn new techniques, how you can go to deep space. Because we now cannot go beyond Mars very easily, because we believe on solar power. <laughs> <laughs> we have big antennas, mm. you cannot make it any bigger. So if you are ambitious, try to see that in your, when you grow up, there should be something that we can cross the asteroid border without thinking how we will do it because we will have other energy resources, we have other communication facility, we will have much bigger you know, antenna and so that we can go beyond it. Into deep space. Another question please. There's a young girl at the back there. Could you ask your question, please? It is said that aliens visited Earth from Mars. So what do you have to say about it? I will not say anything. So but aliens visited I, uh, Earth Martian from Mars? Martian alien has visited Earth. Oh, right. Martian uh, aliens, uh, yeah, of yeah, course, yeah. yeah. OK, <laughs> of course, yeah. Yes, in movies, yes. OK? <laughs> and, uh, but as far as I am concerned, I would only ask you not to listen to what one can call rumor, but if somebody believes it, don't try to force that person out. Like, if you believe it, I will not force you out of it. <laughs> a young lady there. Um, they say that there is a scarcity of fuel, right? And you say that the space shuttle is going to rotate the Earth three times and give a final kick. So Six how times. much fuel is going to be used? And the fuel, the pollution, how is it going to impact on the Earth? Ma'am, are you worried about pollution? We, we, we are up so high up. We are so high up. I think you are surviving the black smoke of the cars and auto rickshaws. You are in Ahmedabad, right? <laughs> cars and auto rickshaws that is coming out. We will have a parts per billion less than that if anything comes from there. Okay. So don't so it's worry. A relatively small <laughs> amount of pollution. There's a question at the back there. I yeah, just wanted to know one thing, uh, since Goswami sir said that the probability of uh, some biosphere out there at the Mars would be 500 years to 1000 years. Why is it not possible to send some uh, plant seeds in our uh, payload and uh, throw it off onto the surface of Mars and... Good question. Let, since there is, one since there is enough of... Seeds with you. I, I like it. Side. No, no, no. And, uh, no, no, it's all right. I, I like the idea, but you see, we, what is the current situation in Mars? He was mentioning about Professor Rao, who happens to be earlier research chairman and from this laboratory only. See, you cannot go like that. You have to go like in a box, which is like a test box. You take something in there and all the parameters that you need, and after some culturing, you have to somehow other put a little out, see what is the reaction. You cannot expect that if we just drop something, it will happen. It will not happen. 
Okay, we have so to set up experimental laboratories. You sound a little bit skeptical about it over the longer period as well, but there's a question at the, uh, the front there. Uh, sir, you mentioned that uh, we're seeing the evolution of atmosphere and uh, gradually we'll uh, try to build the atmosphere. But sir, uh, once the atmosphere has already escaped from Mars, so what is the guarantee that it won't go again? Why is won't the, this new atmosphere that you, you and your colleagues seek to uh, yeah, create, you see, why won't it, it escape? I, I, I agree with you that if we create an atmosphere there, we have to also think how in that gravity, that composition of that atmosphere is good enough to stay back or we have to do something. So it is not a very easy answer. That's why I was giving whether it is 500 years or 1000 years, we cannot tell. But you see, human beings are curious. They would like to do, those smartest people would like to do the dif most difficult task and this is one of those difficult tasks, how to make it happen and someday it may happen and of course I will not be around to see it. You won't be around. <laughs> Sounds like none of us, <laughs> a thousand years, none of us will be around. There's a question there. Uh, myself, Meenal Sampat from Space Application Center. Sir, I would like to ask what are our future still signs which we are missing this time in payloads? What are our future missions of Mars? How we are planning? What is more science we are looking forward for, sir? I Good told question. somebody already that the younger generation now should think something more challenging than older people like can ask and give only old ideas <laughs> and that is not very productive. So I leave it to the other people for future. So he's passing it on to the younger generation. We don't have time for much more, but there's a, uh, there's a lot of people up at the back there. It's going to be hard for somebody to get to them. Uh, what are your focuses on the two natural satellites, the moons of Mars? See, the Phobos and Deimos, as you know, they are hardly, not even few tens of kilometers. They are about 10 and 15 kilometers. One is moving away, other will crash someday on Mars. But if such permits us, if we are close by to them, that is not a scientific objective, but we'll try to take picture of Phobos and Deimos if they come into our view, because we'll move very fast. So we'll try it. It is in the agenda, but not in the official agenda. Okay, good question. Uh, somebody there with my friend. So we have the potential today to get a mission to Mars. So tomorrow we will be having in future to somewhere to Jupiter and around the planets. So why don't we save our the resources and increase our uh, scientific skills and uh, reach to the corners of the solar system? So he wants to know whether we should save our energy to go beyond Mars or should we just spend it all on Mars? See, we are not only not saving energy, we are exploiting it beyond our own requirement and given the society we have today, what you told is just not possible and saving I don't think there is any meaning because we have a lot of it in inside which are still to take out. There are a lot of resources on the earth in the, our planet inside okay and it is very difficult to take them out that's why we are not taking it out. When we run short of it will be more you know ingenuity, ingenuity will be there to take them out so we are not worried. So he's not worried about running out of energy to get there. Uh, there's a question here, and then we'll take one more from the uh, back. Um, good evening, sir. <laughs> Does India have a vision for the next, uh, say, 20 to 30 years in planetary expl uh, exploration? We had, a, we had prepared that vision document in 1997, roughly, and Professor Vandari has left. He was one of the person very deeply involved in it. So that vision is not yet over. We are still to complete that vision and one of that is that we should try to cross the asteroid with different kind of energy resources, not solar energy because we can have it. So I think, see the vision can en uh, enlarge when you have resource also which can realize that vision. Okay, so dream is one thing. Vision should be reality, so we have to go step by step. Step you by step. You should do it. You, it's your job to <laughs> do it. I, um, I, <laughs> there's a question there, and then there's one guy there who I, we must come to afterwards. So uh, you in um, the uh, pink shirt. Sir, is it possible to send a spacecraft to Mars which works using solar system as USA did it some years ago? And you see, actually, if you are telling something the Japanese has done, but it was not solar sail. 
You see, it is in uh, uh, the European has also tried. So a solar sail is a wind uh, yeah, that catches, kept, it's a sail that catches yeah. solar wind and the and idea then, is that it might yeah. be en enough to propel yeah, you but, uh, into what, deep space. Yeah, what you are telling is correct that people are trying it, but it has not been used yet for a planetary mission. But what you are telling is correct. It is an idea. And if an it works, if it is works, it is very exciting. Now, one very last question. This, he, he's had his hand up all the way through this whole. And you never called him I'm to ask to a get question. To him and we've so got if to him we now. cannot go, it's a good question. <laughs> so, if we cannot go beyond Mars, then how can we get the information about different planets and beyond the solar system? How did we get the information? The, about let me tell you, to get information about the solar system, we don't need to go there. Come to Mount Abu. There is a. Uh, <laughs> we have an uh, observatory. You can see where's Mars, this, Saturn. Where's the, where's the observatory? Oh, in Mount Abu, about you know, 200 kilometers from here. Okay. And then I must tell you, from that observatory now, we can detect planets moving around other stars, not in, you know, that what we have done. So you don't have to go all the way out. When you go out, like well, I can see you. If that's true, why are you bothering going to Mars then? <laughs> <laughs> Okay, Justin, here's a point, <laughs> okay? But the point is that what we can do today, we must do and explore, okay? Then think for the next step, okay? But that doesn't mean that we should think of something which others have just tried, but we have to come to, to that level also. We don't have any nuclear energy to propel our spacecraft. Russia and America, uh, they have it. That's why they can go to Saturn, okay? So we must go and go technology-wise so that we can go far out and we should not limit ourselves to the moon, Mars. We should go out, okay? And you are the people who will go out. Keep on going. You, it's your job now to take over and do this. Um, <laughs> and obviously it does seem that there's a new generation of Indian space scientists in the audience here with the standard of the questions that we've been getting from them. But before we go, we'd like to go back to that initial question and ask you about whether you think India, it's important that India gets to Mars before China. We had about 45% of you said you did. How many of you think so now? <laughs> I think, uh, it's about the same, unchanged, yeah. I think. Huh? So the same number of people. Yeah, I, I like it. You like it that way? Yeah, because uh, we are going, we are going. They will go sometime. They will, uh, that's fine. But you're going to get there first? No, <laughs> not necessarily you're not, true. That's not important to you? Not, not important. Not we should go. Me? <laughs> I don't know about that. <laughs> I'm Justin Rowlett. I hope you've enjoyed this fascinating discussion about India's mission to Mars. Remember, the mission is currently due to blast off on November the 5th. You've been listening to Exchanges at the Frontier with me, Justin Rowlett. And on behalf of the BBC World Service, our partners, Welcome Collection, and my producer, excellent producer, Charlie Taylor, I'd like to thank the Physical Research Laboratory for hosting us here in Ahmedabad. But most of all, I would like to call on our fabulous audience here to join me in applauding our gracious guest, Jitendra Goswami.